Welcome and thank you for joining today's Collaborating for Marine Renewable Energy Data Collection and Dissemination Primer. Please note that all participant lines will be muted for the duration of the call. You are welcome to submit written questions during the presentation and these will be addressed during Q&A. To send a note, select All Panelists on the Send To drop-down menu of the chat panel located on the lower right-hand side of your screen. If you require technical assistance, Send a note to the event producer or call our help desk at 888-796-6118. With that, I'll turn the call over to Andrea Cotting, Senior Research Scientist. Please go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning or good afternoon. This is Andrea Copping with Pacific Northwest National Laboratory in Seattle. And with me, I have my colleagues, Rick Driscoll and John Weirs from the National Renewable Energy Lab in Colorado, Kelly Rule and Annie Dahlman from Sandia National Laboratories in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Um, and we're very pleased to have you here today so we can talk a little bit about the work we've been doing on bringing together data associated with marine renewable energy in order to better collaborate, uh, standardize and disseminate those data. And this, we're calling, uh, the, the work we've been doing Primer, the, uh, portal and repository for information on marine renewable energy, which we'll describe in a little bit. Um, <clears throat> oh my, why is that not going forward? So, um, on today's webinar, we're going to talk a little bit about the importance of data and data connectivity. We're going to talk about some of the threats that come from not having that connectivity and the benefits from connecting and sharing data. We will run through for you the needs assessments we've done with the marine renewable energy community, talk about primer, and then sort of wrap it up by telling you some of the, about some of the work we've been doing on this project this past year, particularly updates to the MHK data repository to TESIS and what our future plans are. And then we're really hoping uh, that you will participate in the end to provide us your feedback, ask questions, and so on. And as our moderator said, you can type those questions into the chat box at any time during the presentation. Okay, so to, to be clear right up at the beginning, when we say data, we really mean data and information. And that can be a whole range of things. It can be tabular, raw, or quality control data, but also all these other sorts of things you, you see here. And we are actively collecting many of these reports and measurements, uh, metadata, cost uh, analyses. Um, we also include in this such things as open source codes, models, etc. So the importance of uh, data in marine renewable energy development. We know that data and information can play a significant role in advancing technology, solving environmental challenges, and other um, areas necessary for moving the industry forward. But we all know that collecting data can be expensive. It is often very difficult, very challenging, even dangerous. So we are at such an early stage in this industry, uh, marine renewables, particularly wave and tidal, that it's really important that the whole sector learns together rather than competing. And we do know from other industries that there's a good opportunity to accelerate the industry by gathering and sharing data. We've seen this in other industries such as wind and geothermal, aviation, and so on. And the peacock at the right just is a, a visual sort of representation of all the different portions of advancing this industry that really are dependent on having good data and information from resource characterization through evaluating technology, uh, failure analysis, health monitoring of devices, environmental challenges, uh, uh, and model validation. Um, the current state of affairs, we have a good deal of information that has been collected in the U.S. and certainly internationally as well, um, but often those data are squirreled away somewhere, they're not made public, they're uh, stored in various different locations and different formats, they're often not cataloged, and um, the uh, representation here, of course, is all this great information from reports and data, resource characterization, the lessons we've learned, go going into a black hole. 
And what this leads the users, represented by the puzzled-looking groups over on the right, really not sure where to go with this. So what I'd like to do now is turn this over to John Weirs, who's a great deal more of a data expert than I am, to talk a little bit about the benefits that we can find from sharing data. So go ahead, John. Thanks. Yeah, as Andrea mentioned, I'm John Weirs from the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. And right now, uh, as we're seeing with this black hole diagram, a lot of the information that's being generated out there is just disappearing into a void. Um, and that's a metaphorical void. It can be that the data are literally being lost and going into some sort of virtual black hole. Um, but it can also be that the data are not being cataloged or described in a way that makes them usable or stored in locations that are difficult to find or are hidden behind some sort of paywall or otherwise unaccessible. And so those can be uh, insurmountable challenges in disseminating information. Um, a lot of people are aware of the technical challenges of sharing data. You know, like I was describing earlier, insufficient metadata or descriptive information doesn't tell you enough about the data in order for you to use it effectively. That's obvious. Um, Lack of reliable service providers, you know, websites housing data that just disappear when they run out of funding, um, or, or uh, the last one, discoverability. Um, just because something's online doesn't mean it can't be found. Um, you could have a perfectly good source of information um, where everything's well cataloged and described and accessible, but if it's not discoverable and if no one knows how to get to it, then it's essentially in a black hole that don't. And those technological shortcomings are just the tip of the iceberg. There are a lot of organizational challenges as well. It can be difficult to get support from leadership to uh, make data available to the public and share information. Just getting organizational buy-in to share information uh, can be a substantial challenge. A lot of uh, private companies especially, but even uh, even in the research institutions and and other um, areas, there's a propensity to want to hold your data, you know, close to your chest and make sure that your achievements are yours and that everyone knows that they're yours. And there's a way to do that and still share the results and the findings, uh, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. Um, having proper review and quality control is a big concern for upper management and a lot of organizations because they're worried about reputational risk uh, and the the perception of putting data out there that might not be 100% accurate or could someday uh, be out of date. And then, of course, there are many financial challenges. A lot of people don't think about publishing their data until the end of a project life cycle, and at that point, the money is spent, and there's not a lot of money left to get the data into a format where it's usable by the general public. I mean, there's a big difference between having data um, usable by the people that are working on the project. You know, they're aware of all the acronyms. They're aware of all the assumptions. They they were there on, you know, the third day of the project where hypothetically the device stopped recording, and so they know why it's all zeros that day. But to convey that information to the general public, you know, you have to put the appropriate metadata in place so that anyone coming across the data set can understand what happened and why and what the assumptions were. And that takes a fair amount of work. There's a cost to that. There's a cost to translating data from proprietary formats to publicly consumable formats. And unless those costs are planned in from the beginning, it can be difficult to scrounge up money at the end of a project. And so there, there are a lot of challenges for sharing data, um, many of which uh, we all deal with on a daily basis. but I'm, I'm going to tell you why it's all worthwhile. Because um, ultimately, data locked in a desk drawer is just a wasted resource. You know, the whole point of information dissemination is to communicate knowledge. Um, knowledge has no value if it's not communicated or used or applied in some way. If it's just locked up in somebody's desk and that person retires and then facilities comes and moves that desk and hauls it down to the junkyard and it's lost forever, then that's a wasted effort. 
And what we want to do is put that data to work for us. We need to communicate that information. We need to transfer that knowledge so that we can continue to propel the MHK and MRE industries forward to advance, innovate, and create. Open sharing of knowledge reduces duplication of effort. Even the sharing of unsuccessful experiments, you know, it, it, it's incredibly valuable because it can help other people avoid those same pitfalls and help focus resources and efforts on new uh, efforts and studies that continue to propel the industry forward. There's the classic saying that a rising tide lifts all boats, and I really do think that applies in this regard. Um, open access to the fruits of our research labors will help enable innovation, uh, especially through the sharing of raw data. And I have a fun story about that from NOAA, where raw data uh, is intrinsically reuseful, and it remains free to be used in any context. And what I mean by that is, when we're putting together our project data and we think about, you know, the classic view of putting your data out there is to think about generating a report and a summary of your research efforts, and that's certainly important. Everyone wants to know what the project outcome was and how we got there and what the, uh, the methodologies were and the input data, but what's also valuable is the raw data. Raw data is not summarized, and summary data is, is by its very nature, biased towards a particular objective, uh, that objective being the project itself whereas raw data is free to be used in any context. And this NOAA story is a really fun example of that. It comes from my colleague, Ed Kearns, who's the chief data officer for the um, for NOAA here in the U.S. And the idea is that NOAA has, for many years, made their radar data uh, available to the public, and that polished, refined radar data uh, is a... a 3D database of clouds and precipitation patterns that are used in weather forecasts all across the United States and, and in actually countries worldwide. And to get that data, they take their radar network, all their Doppler radars, and scrub out all the background noise like ground reflections and birds, airplanes, and other stuff so that they end up with just clouds. And a few years back, NOAA got this great idea of opening up the raw radar data set and putting it out there online just to see if anyone had any uh, improvements to their scrubbing algorithm. And so they made it available, and they announced it, and they had a sort of a competition. And not surprisingly, uh, a few university research students working on their doctoral theses came across those data and came up with a better algorithm to scrub out all the background clutter, the birds and the, the noise, and came up with a more accurate, more definitive cloud model. And virtually overnight, every weather forecast in the United States got more accurate as NOAA was keen to adopt that model. The cool part and the reason raw data is valuable is that a group of ornithologists came along and found that same data set and did the process in reverse. They scrubbed out all the clouds and the airplanes and stuff, and they were left over with 50 years worth of highly detailed 3D model bird migrations across the U.S. So we have a whole new use for the same data set, completely unrelated to the original intent, but somebody's finding tremendous value in what was essentially the waste of somebody else's efforts. And so that's just a really fun example of how raw data can actually lead to innovation and can actually create new markets of opportunity for those data. There are a lot of other benefits of sharing data. And I've already talked about quite a few of them. Obviously, um, reducing duplication of efforts, uh, reducing costs and development times. We're able to build upon the successes of others and move forward. Accelerating innovation by either providing access to data sets or ideas that weren't previously accessible, um, but also creating new business opportunities. So we've seen in some of our other projects where 
continuation of research efforts has been funded by other entities because they came across the data from those data sets and said, you know, we're looking at doing something similar. Oh, somebody else has already done this. And this is a big concern. A lot of organizations are worried about putting their data out there because they want to keep the, um, the fruits of their labor as proprietary. But what a lot of companies don't realize is that, you know, everyone's under a time crunch. Everyone has limited funds. And no one's really that excited about duplicating all your research or your efforts. And so if they come across data that's in line with what they're trying to do, uh, more times than not, they're inclined to hire the company or the team or the researchers that originally did those projects and have them help continue that work. And so we've actually seen a lot of uh, new business opportunities and partnerships come out of open sharing of data and information as well. And with that, I will pass it back to my colleague, Andrea. Andrea, you may still be on mute. Thank you very much. <laughs> Sorry. Thanks, John. Okay, we've talked a little bit about the um, uh, current situation where data are disconnected and not readily available. And John has talked about the advantages of sharing data. Now, with that background, this uh, team uh, went out and spent some time. Um, I'm not there. Oh, let's go back one. Not sure why that's happening. I go back one slide. Sorry. Okay, we went out and um, met with a great many of the uh, marine renewable energy community. We have a uh, steering committee made up of developers, researchers, regulators, and others who help advise us. We held two fair size workshops in 2017, one around the Marine Energy Technology Symposium held in Washington, D.C. in uh, May 2017, and one around the European Wave and Tidal Energy Conference in Ireland in 2017. And you see from these pie charts, we had a pretty good representation of people from different countries. Um, we also had good representation of different members of different parts of the sector including industry in the test centers, we had the researchers, and so on. We've also done a couple of webinars, and we've had a survey out there online for some time. And gathering all that information together, what we've discovered is sort of a common set of issues or needs. Um, the first, no surprise, that data and information are hard to find. They're often not public. And the fear, of course, being that we could lose many of the lessons we've learned, repeat mistakes, spend more money at it. We know that there is quite a wide range of analysis methods going on, many of them inconsistent. And this could, in fact, be leading to design errors and false conclusions and really sort of uh, cause the industry to stutter when it should be able to be moving forward very rapidly. Um, we know that environmental studies in different parts, even of the same country, much less internationally, are carried out in different ways and they're isolated from one another. And we also know that there are people producing very similar codes and models in parallel, uh, duplicating efforts. Um, finally, it's clear that without having good sharing of data and learning lessons, it means that future data collection efforts may not be optimized. And all in all, this leads us to higher costs and longer development time. So the paint swirl you see on the right is our organizational uh, attempt to get at answering these needs. And um, we see that one of the big elements of that is the need to have data discoverability, as John has mentioned and is going to talk about some more in a bit, uh, good search tools, comprehensive metadata, it's very important that we do have good integrity of that data, that the data are taken on board somewhere, they're curated, they're indexed, and we know that what the quality assurance levels are. Um, by having a series of best practices and standards, we can very much move forward knowing that, that um, the data that we do share is of an, um, uh, an optimal and known quality. Um, Accessibility and security to databases is obviously two sides of the coin, but both equally important. We want to make sure that data are accessible, but we all are 
very much aware of cybersecurity these days, the need to make these data sets secure. Developing tools and codes, particularly making anything open source readily available so they can be reproduced is very important. We also see the need for a strong platform for outreach and communication, everything from you know, uh, bringing people new to the industry in, including investors, giving them some, some overview, current news and events, and the ability to really bring that community together. So from this, we've created our vision we call Primer, Portal and Repository for Information on Marine Renewable Energy. And very broadly, that vision is to make sure that there's access to data um, useful for the marine renewable energy industry development. And that includes uh, various data to do with engineering and technologies, resource characterization, environmental um, assessments, and so on. So we have set up Primer so that it will establish a data portal to carry out this vision, this broad access. We will support access to online tools. We are very much committed to setting this context for making it easy and um, uh, to uh, discover the appropriate data and information for use by any member of the community. And we also believe that in addition to facilitating ways to bring data and information together, we think this has the ability to bring the whole community together around some common standards, some common purpose, and some common data. So in here in the U.S., uh, the U.S. Department of Energy has um, uh, sponsored a number of different databases and data portals, and we're trying graphically to show that here. In the center, you see the OpenEI, Open uh, Energy Information um, uh, site, uh, which is really useful and has some loose connections to several other um, databases. And it also hosts the MHK Data Repository, which is where testing data, resource characterization data, various other data that are um, collected during DOE-sponsored projects are located. Over on the left, you see TFIS, which is the Knowledge Management System for Environmental Effects. And then there are several others. There's an instrumentation database, which um, allows the community to share their use of instruments, calibrations, and so on. In most cases, we are using somewhat standardized oceanographic equipment in collecting data, but often using it in ways that were never envisioned before. And you can see floating off in about 2 o'clock the other U.S. and international databases, which aren't really very connected at all. And surrounding this whole set of data sets, data portals, databases, are those users, again, the ones that need the information. And while there is some connectivity here and there, there's not a lot. It's quite limited. And there really is no common entry point to figure out how to get into this whole sort of maze of portals and databases and navigate your way around. So what we are attempting to do is really improve those connections and have a common entry point. That common entry point is built on the OpenEI Water Power Gateway, which we're calling Primer. And you see from the green arrows how we are attempting this uh, basically two-way connection to many of these databases, to many of the users. And that includes other U.S. and international databases. We think it's very important. Primer's not going to uh, engulf everything, but we think those connectivities are really, really important. And we do think this is a way to, to make this access so much more open and um, uh, complete. So this is what the primer entry point looks like on the water power page of OpenEI. It's still under development, but this is more or less what it'll look like. It'll provide some background to primer and uh, some instructions on how to use primer, how to get around, how to make connections. It'll have access data points to each of the major data or knowledge bases. And it'll also have background information, for particularly for those first coming to primer, um, some Marine Renewable Energy 101 glossaries will also have an up-to-date news and information uh, feed going on there. So, and we do have the, um, the uh, URL, primer.org. So it may not be fully functional yet, but it's coming right along. But it's important to also recognize what primer is not. 
This is not an attempt to unite all U.S. marine renewable energy databases into one database. There will always be separate projects with separate driven data sources. Um, we, our desire here is to provide connectivity and links rather than make it all one piece. Um, we don't see this becoming a global online data repository. We cannot take data um, uh, from all over the world, curate it, house it, and, and so on. Um, right now, MHK Data Repository is carrying out that function for U.S. data, and we would strongly encourage that, that um, other data sources from other countries, which have similar sorts of um, repositories, link closely to the primer, and we can discuss ways to index back and forth and so on. We also really hope primer won't just be one more database. We really want to try to provide more value added, including uh, making sure we have a repository for codes that are developed, codes and models. Uh, we are in the process of moving TETHIS, which has focused entirely on environmental effects. We'll be including the same access to information, uh, reports, papers, and so on, curated and indexed uh, for engineering and technologies, and so much more. So what I want to do now is I want to, we're going to talk about a couple of our major uh, pushes and tasks this year for two of our major um, data uh, repositories, one uh, databases, knowledge bases. The first is TESIS, and my organization, uh, Pacific Northwest National Laboratory, developed and um, uh, maintains TESIS. Uh, many of you may be familiar with TETHIS, but so, so bear with me if this is old hat. Uh, TETHIS is a knowledge management system that deals with the environmental effects of marine renewables. It's publicly access, accessible, and we constantly curate and update the content of it. Right now, there's a little over 4,000 documents, which are papers, reports, and other media. They are hand-selected for relevance, and they're tagged for easy searchability. And um, if you were to go to any one of them, you'd find an abstract and access to the paper, et cetera. Um, and it can be viewable two different ways. I'm going to show you in a minute, a knowledge base and also uh, geographically a map viewer. We also use TIFAS to support a whole range of outreach activities, some of which are listed there, including webinars and um, news and events and so on and so forth. We send out a bi-weekly um, email listserv, if you will, called TIFAS Blast, and we have about 12 or 1,300 on that mailing list. So please join us. There's the URL, in case you're not familiar. Um, going under the hood of TIFAS a little bit, the heart of it, it really is this knowledge base. And this is just, think of it as a large database of uh, documents. Um, I just took a screenshot here. I did a quick search. I chose the particular um, type of uh, a document I want. In this case, I chose journal articles. I chose a technology, in this case, title. And I chose marine mammals. And then this went on for several pages. That's just a screenshot of that. Um, at the same time, and one of the areas we've worked on uh, improving this year, you can go to the uh, top little spot there, probably not that visible on your screen, that allows you to toggle to the map viewer. And what you will get is a Google um, map view like this of the world. And um, this indexes all georeferenced uh, papers, reports, etc. So not every single entry in the knowledge base is georeferenced, but if they are, then they appear on the map. And you get these sort of blue hurricane-like things. If you were to uh, focus in on this huge hurricane sort of over um, uh, the British Isles and um, Ireland, um, you can zoom in and that hurricane breaks apart into yet more pieces. And each of those pieces will uh, bring you a dialog box that shows you what documents are available. It'll give you basic information about it and allow you direct access into it. And we've worked on improving the map viewer over this past year, and we'll go on doing so uh, in terms of speed, accessibility, and uh, searchability. The other aspect of um, uh, TESIS that we have worked on, TESIS is not a data repository in the normal sense. We do not take data. 
we um, have a good deal of metadata. And as environmental monitoring uh, data sets are becoming available from devices that are in the water, uh, some of the pre-commercial and early commercial devices in Europe, um, we felt the need to index where these data sets are. And uh, what you see is a piece of that um, metadata portal, if you will. It has drop-down menus at the top that will allow you to search by the type of data you're looking for, stressor, that is that part of the system that might be causing stress, receptors, the animals or habitats. And if you were to zoom in on one of these, just as an example, it would take you to a page that looks like this, which is very reminiscent of many of the document pages. This happens to be for uh, the Flowback um, set of environmental uh, data that have been collected at the European Marine Energy Center. It describes the data and so on and so forth. And where the data are downloadable, there is a direct link. It could be to one of our data sets here in the U.S. This one wouldn't, obviously, but it could be in the MHK data repository, or it could be to another data set. But one of the most important things that we have ensured is available is a contact person. And apologies to, to Benjamin Williamson. I picked this one out, display his name here. But it is incredibly important if you're trying to uh, link people up to share data and the data are not necessarily downloadable, or perhaps the user has questions that there's a live person you can actually communicate with. So that's sort of the progress we've been making in TFIS, um this past year. And I'm going to turn it over back to John Weirs to talk a little bit about progress that they've been making in MHK Data Repository. So go ahead, John. Great, thanks. So yeah, I'm going to talk a little bit of uh, some of the improvements in the MHK data repository. And I also noticed there is a question in chat that looks like it was um, mostly answered by the um, some of the slides that Andrea was reading. But I will go ahead and take a stab at answering it. Uh, any thoughts on Primer directing users to other portals with ocean project planning tools, for example, NOAA's BOEM? Uh, yes, absolutely. We are going to link to anything that we deem is relevant, um, and not just U.S.-centric or U.S. government-centric things. We want it to really be an all-inclusive information discovery portal, so there will be links to all the major data and knowledge players. And we have a um, follow-up question, you know, are you planning to identify other public domain portals, GIS planning tools, databases, maintained by other agencies? Yes, absolutely. And we're putting together a list of all the sites that Primer should link to, and we're certainly open to suggestions. So please feel free to use the comments and feedback from this presentation or uh, reach out to us afterwards to add things to that list. Okay. Back to MHKDR functionality. We have listened to the feedback from users, and we've gotten quite a bit, actually. We coalesced it, prioritized it uh, in line with what uh, low-hanging fruit we could take care of early and quickly last year, and we have quite a bit left that we're planning to do uh, in this coming year. But what we've already done that we're quite proud of is completely redesign the home page and navigation with the primary goal of improving data discoverability. Um, we can still search for data by term or keyword. That's been improved as well, which I'll show on the next slide. We've added shortcuts to popular topics like the Wave Energy Prize and River and Current uh, subcategories of energy. We're now featuring data sets right on the home page and we can rotate those as we see fit. Um, they're, they're kind of an assortment of data based off popularity, but then also of um, things that are just topically of interest and stuff that's going on in the industry. And then we have a what's new section at the bottom, uh, which is primarily focused on improvements to the platform itself. So talking about the improved search and data discovery, some of the enhancements we made to the submission form for data submitters and some improvements we've made there to make it easier for people to submit data submissions to the DOE MHK data repository. Um, 
such as there's no more limits on file size, we're now using an infinitely scalable drive in a secure corner of the Amazon cloud so that we can accommodate any size data set uh, that anyone's interested in throwing at us. A little background if you're not familiar with it, the DOE MHK data repository is the repository for all data generating from research funded by the U.S. Department of Energy MHK Technologies Program. And so there are uh, no data in there that are not funded by the U.S. Department of Energy, although we have considered opening that up. Um, we're still having those discussions. But it is at the moment limited to data uh, resulting from efforts funded by the Department of Energy. As I mentioned, we've made some significant improvements to our search page. We have, obviously, the regular keyword search um, and result counts and some of what I would consider standard search features. We've refactored the way our search results show up. As you can see in the lower right, we have more descriptive results with title and a sample of the abstract from each data submission page, um, authors and the quick view of the organization, and of course the date, and then you can now sort results um, by most recent submission or relevance. And relevance uses a rather complicated search engine on the background for the techies in the room uh, built on Solar, which is a, a pretty standard search technology. And then we've added a whole new set of facets um, that were essentially uh, organized by committee and, uh, and refined by community feedback into what we hope is very uh, logical and topical way of slicing and dicing up all the different data that the MHK data repository contains. So we can facet on topic, technology type, whether something's in testing or deployment, or if it's demonstration, uh, and then individual data types as well, you know, whether it's a document or an image or a PDF. Um, so we're, we're continuing to make improvements to that, and we actually have a few more suggestions on refining that uh, from industry that we'll be rolling out in the next month or so. So that's a living, breathing work in progress, and we certainly welcome any feedback you may have on helping to make the data in the MHK data repository more discoverable. If you were to click one of those search results, it would take you to our data landing pages. And so each data set can have any number of data files in it, um, and we're trying to package those together into a complete thought package so that you have, and then we put a data set landing page around it. And so the idea is that every file comes with all the supporting information necessary to get a true understanding of what those data are and what they mean. And so the typical data landing pages have title and abstracts. Um, we've improved our data landing pages. We're not changing any of the content that was on here previously, but what we've done is reorganize it, burying things like uh, DOE-specific information and additional project information down at the bottom with related data sets and sort of centering the focus of the page on the data, the data themselves and the descriptions of those data and then the accessibility of those data. So in this particular screenshot, you can see download links with the size of the data set. Some of our data are protected. They're under a moratorium for a period of time. That means uh, they're not available for the public until uh, predetermined proprietary agreement lapses. So some companies will sign proprietary agreements with the Department of Energy and then their data are protected for, you know, two or three years or some period of time. During that time, all of this metadata that you're looking at on the screen is still available, the title, the description, and the resources. And the reason is that just knowing that something exists but you can't quite have access to it yet is still very important, uh, especially in the field of reducing duplication of effort like I was discussing before. And so data will still show up in search results if it's not available yet, but instead of a download button, you'll see a data available on this particular date button. There are a few data sets in MHKDR, MHKDR that are subject to that. 
Um, but you also have the contact, the primary contact information right there on the screen as well. So if you want to, you can contact the person who originated that data set and beg and feed them for an advanced copy of those data or potentially form uh, a business partnership with them during the proprietary period. And then we have authors, keywords, status, publicly accessible, license and availability, because it's very important, especially for the end users of these data, you know, the researchers and the students out there, to let them know that, yes, they can use it. And this is the license and terminology. This is exactly how you can use it legally. And then we even have a button at the bottom where you can click that, and it'll, it'll automatically generate an MLA formatted citation for you and copy it to your clipboard. So you can just paste it right into any report you're writing or anything you might be working on where you want to cite these data. And then one other convenient thing that we've added uh, that a lot of people seem to really like is a download all button. Um, this particular screenshot just shows a data set with four individual files. Some of our data sets have hundreds of files, and if you want them all, um, it's very tedious to download them individually, obviously. So we have now a download all button, which will, behind the scenes, zip up all the resources into a single file and then deliver it to you, and uh, you can download them all at once. And that came out of user feedback. So I would like to just reiterate that we're very interested to hear your feedback, and we'd love to get your ideas added to our list of features to develop in the coming year. Please don't hold back. So that's the, uh, the nature of the improvements to the MHKDR that we've done already as part of this project. Um, we have plans in the future of linking more directly with TPIS and some of the other tools that are going to be identified in Primer, and then, of course, linking directly with the Primer portal and creating better uh, information channels there. Um, but there's already a lot of progress in linking to other systems that's been made. The MHKDR was actually built from the ground up to disseminate information, and so it already has an existing network of data sharing partners. Um, a lot of time and effort has been put into making the metadata about the data in the MHKDR available through a series of different international standard formats and technologies that allow other data repositories to connect automatically to the MHKDR. And so what that means is every data set on the MHKDR propagates automatically to all the sites you see here on this page, data.gov, OpenEI, um, the Department, or the Office of Science and Technical Information, Thomson Reuters generates a mini press release for each data set, and, uh, and it goes out to a bunch of international partners, worldwidescience.org, et cetera. Um, and the data on the MHKDR show up in the catalogs of those repositories as well. Uh, it's a, using a technology we call federation, which is really cool because seamlessly users of any of those sites can do a search on any of those sites, and they, depending on their search criteria, may see MHKDR results in their search results. And if they click the link or if they click the file, they think they're downloading the file right from those sites. So if somebody's on data.gov and they click something, they, they just get the file. So from a user's perspective, it's seamless, it's easy, but behind the scenes, what's happening is the request for that file is traveling all the way back through the network to the MHKDR and serving it up, which is brilliant because there's no duplication of storage and there's no duplication of effort here. Uh, the data are stored securely in the MHKDR, but made available through dozens and dozens of sites, um, not just the ones shown here, which really allows us to disseminate those information to the broader scientific community in a very efficient manner. And we've seen uh, a tremendous increase in exposure from being connected to this network. We're collecting metrics on downloads both directly from the MHKDR and through the network. And so we're very pleased to say that for every user that comes to the MHKDR and downloads a file, almost 10,000 users download that same file through the extended network of data sharing partners. So through Primer, we're really excited uh, to hopefully grow that network and, uh, and increase those metrics even more and get a, get a wider reach and disseminate our information further. And so that's the MHKDR in a nutshell. And I will pass it 
to my colleague Kelly to discuss the future. All right, thank you very much, John and Andrea, for going through the goals of Primer and the accomplishments made thus far on the development of TFIS and the NHKGR. And I'm going to talk a bit about the future work that's planned for Primer in this year and future years. Um, so we have them listed here numerically, but, you know, this isn't necessarily a reflection of their order of importance or priority. These are just the, the five kind of subtasks that we've identified to focus our energy on for the development of Primer. And so um, the first one is connection to data partners, and that's um, the improvement of the federation of data between systems like the MHKDR and TFIS so that it's easy to find information on both sites without duplicating efforts. Um, the second is TFIS engineering, and so the focus here is going to be to expand the TFIS knowledge man management system to include um, what we've called, you know, kind of engineering papers and reports and media. So the focus, for those of you who are not already aware of TFIS currently, is more on the environmental side, and we're going to expand it to include um, more of the engineering content. Um, as John already discussed a bit, um, with the MHKDR, um, the third task is going to, and, and Andrea on TFIS, um, the third subtask is the Enhanced MHK Data Search. So that is focused on improving the data discoverability <clears throat> through better um, facets and filters, focused primarily on MHKDR, but also, also all throughout Primer. And um, we do have a question on the chat box that's related to this fourth item, and we'll circle back to that question, but hopefully this uh, gives a preview of the response, which is, the, the other subtask is uh, data best practices and standards. So <clears throat> the thought here is to draft guidance and standards um, for metadata, data, and file formats, um, specifically for MHDR submissions, but this is also applicable to um, generating open source data, data processing codes and data analysis. Um, if you have <clears throat> a standardization of, of data and file types and file formats, that eases the, um, the data analysis aspect. Um, and then the last subtask is the MHK Technology Database. Um, for those of you who are not already familiar, the MHK Technology Database is currently housed on OpenEI, and it is a database that includes um, a, a broad array of the different MHK technologies and companies and their, their status. Um, so one of our tasks is to update this technology database to reflect the current status of the industry and to, to release that on Primer. And that, this is all work that's ongoing and will continue throughout um, this year and, and into the following years. And I just wanted to kind of add a little plug in here for Primer as well because um, the site isn't, isn't fully ready for release right now, but all of this content will be available as we've you know, discussed throughout the throughout this talk on the Primer website. Um, and we'll continue to have webinars on each of those individual topics throughout um, throughout the duration of the project and we'll obviously post announcements to that and, and record them so that they can be seen publicly as well. Okay, next slide. Um, so I just wanted to kind of circle back on what we see as the the impacts of Primer. So um, the overall impact of Primer is to provide high-quality, organized, familiar locations for marine renewable energy community access and interaction to the best available information. So that's a pretty broad statement. But what we mean by that specifically is that, you know, right now if you wanted to understand what's the status of the industry, what are the different developers that are out there, and how do I access the data set, and what's the latest on um, engineering paper on a specific topic or um, has someone used this piece of instrumentation before? Right now there isn't kind of a, a, a go-to landing point to look for that information. And that's our real goal with Primer is to provide that centralized location on dissemination point for marine renewable energy, marine hydrokinetic 
energy-related information. It also provide access to different online tools in the existing knowledge base and integration of the data and in a, integration of the existing um, databases and data sources to support the community. Um, so I think that some of those kind of circle back to some of the questions in the chat, which I'll, I'll touch upon. But I just wanted to say thanks for everyone for attending. We're going to post um, the webinar slides and the recording on um, on the OpenEI site. Um, we've done that in the past for um, the, the data needs a webinar that we hosted back in February. That's also publicly available and recorded. Or you can contact us directly if you have um, if you have any questions or comments. But I'm first going to start with the questions and comments that are in the chat box. And um, so if you have any other follow-up questions, comments, feedback that you'd like to type into the chat box, please feel free to do so. And I'm going to start with the ones that are already there. So the first one is from Vince Neary, and the, and the question I think has largely already been answered by John about are there any thoughts to um, have primer links to other portals on, you know, ocean project planning tools such as BOEM, NOAA, um, and John already touched on this. Yes, that's, that's actually the goal of primer itself is not just to link to the DOE-centric sites, but of related sites. And the other follow-up question was, um, is one of the aspects of this project to identify public portals, GIS planning tools, databases, um, and, and other resources that are managed by other agencies like NOAA? And I would say um, in the past year, that was actually one of our milestones, is we have a, a large, you know, spreadsheet that documented a bunch of the different related um, databases and sites that we identified as important for a primer to be linked to. Um, but obviously, you know, there's, there's new projects, new information constantly available. So that's an ongoing task throughout the project. And I'd also like to put in a plug for the fact that this is um, an open source platform. You can create a, a login account and modify content. So um, if a person has a new data set or a new um, paper or resource that they want to add, um, they're able to do so themselves. Let's see. And then the other question is, has this project um, developed guidance for researchers on um, formulating, da for formulating data management, cataloging plans for the MHK project that would allow seamless transfer to Primer or the MHK data repository? And um, that's actually one of those specific items that we highlighted in the in the future work plan. So most certainly that's one of the outcomes of this project is to provide that type of guidance. Would you like to add something to that, Rick? <laughs> um, this, this is Rick Russell from Anrel. Um, so that, that's actually a, a, a very important piece, but the we need to develop um, a international framework to make that happen and we've engaged the uh, well we've engaged with the IEA OES and looking at how we can get the international community to look at this you know starting you know from the, from the basics um, you know uh, what do we call the different things that we measure for example and what units do we use to refer them and, and such and work your work our way up from there but there's so, so not just this project but there's a, I think a broader endeavor to make this happen I should also mention there's also an effort within the uh, IEC um, uh, standards group to come up with standardized uh, definitions and such. So building from, you know, the, the very basics uh, um, and moving forward from there to more complex, like specifying specific file formats and such. So. Yeah, and one other thing I'd like to put in as a plug for that, um, that link to the IEC is as part of this project, we have a steering committee. We call it the MHK um, Steering Committee, the MHK Data Community Steering Committee. And um, one of the members of that steering committee is very highly involved in IEC standards development. And um, that's one of their, um, you know, focuses is to make sure that the, the outcomes of this project are link to the IEC standards work and that we can work together to, to provide that guidance. Um, so that's all of the written questions that we have, and I, I believe that the 
host is going to open this up to the audio up to the participants if they'd like to ask verbal questions. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, as we move to Q&A, please feel free to place yourself into the question queue by pressing pound 2 on your telephone keypad. You will hear a notification when your line is unmuted. At that time, please state your name and question. And of course, you can ask written questions by sending your message to all panelists on the Send To drop-down menu of the chat panel located on the lower right-hand side of your screen. Okay, and we'll give a few moments for that. Again, that's pound two if you have a verbal question. And I don't seem to be receiving any verbal questions yet. Okay, Andrea, it doesn't look like we're uh, receiving any questions. Um, yeah, I guess we're um, uh, very pleased to have had everybody on the line today. Thank you very much. You see from the last slide up there, you've got the ability to um, uh, look at this information online. It will be posted shortly. And please feel free to contact any one of us if you have questions. So thank you for your uh, interest and uh, time this morning. And uh, please think hard about uh, engaging with us as we develop Primer further through the individual data portals or collectively. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day. Thank you for joining today's conference. The session is now concluded, and you may disconnect. Okay, and I have gone ahead and muted us from the phone audience. If anyone has okay. anything else they'd like to address. Thanks, Marvin. Yeah, I think that was fine. I mean, we had an okay audience um, for a period of time, and I'm glad Vince wanted to ask questions. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and he had good ones. And, I mean, I think that it speaks to the quality of the presentation that, you know, we – about two slides from when he asked the question, it was already answered in the content. So yeah. that's, you know, that's a yeah. good reflection of the quality of our of our presentation. Yeah. Oh, I really like how so, when yeah, I, the, the new content, how it, it just, I think, builds the story and then fills in the, you know, basically how, how we're going to solve all the, the issues out there in the world. <laughs> all the issues in the yeah. world. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, guys, I think we're good. Um, Marvin, right, thank you very good. much. And Amy, and uh, yeah, we're good. So we're yes. not meeting this afternoon, uh, team, right? Well, that's what I wanted to ask is, um, do we want to do a debrief, or do we just want to wait until our regularly scheduled meeting next week? I don't need to know if we need a debrief. I have, um, if people have got 10 minutes, um, this afternoon, I, I need to, I talked to Rick briefly about this. There's some opportunities that came up around OTEC that I'd kind of like to talk about. Kind of didn't okay. get, I kind of didn't get to. Um, are you guys okay to sign on? I promise it will be short. Uh, yeah, I'm happy to. I can. Oh, wait a, minute, wait a minute. What am I saying? No, I have a DOE. I put a DOE. No, wait. Today's Wednesday. How about I'll, Andrea? I'll I'll how throw that in the agenda for next week on Tuesday. Our regular yep. meeting is that you wanted Let's to do that on your on on some of the follow up yeah, yeah, items yeah. for the Yes, please do. Okay, Perfect. that sounds very good. Well, thank you everybody <laughs> for um for joining and Andrea and Rick for doing such a great job leading the presentation. I think it went really well. Sorry, okay, John. Thanks, guys. <laughs> thank you, John. <laughs> So, right, Rick and I are basically Thanks interchangeable. There you yeah. go. Uh, yeah, I mean, definitely. <laughs> I'll take it as a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, you guys have a great day. And, uh, John, if you do end up making it out to the end of UTC at some point, I'll be here through Friday. <laughs> oh, cool. Yeah, I'm slammed with meetings today, so I probably won't make it much further than, than the cube down from my desk, but um, maybe tomorrow. <laughs> Yeah, sounds great. I'll be around. Maybe we can do lunch or something. Yeah, yeah that'd be great. I won't be here for barbecue. <laughs> you should try that. Yeah. All right. Okay. Thanks, everyone. All right. Thank you. Bye. Okay, bye. Thanks, guys. Okay. Bye. Bye. bye.